October 5th. We started moving again before the sun was up. We left the tents behind, along with everything that had belonged to Candace. We took only what we needed to survive. A quick check through her tent had revealed nothing of value, and none of us cared if we ever saw her again. David kept ahead of us, as if he was avoiding us, and I tried my best to catch up with him. The snow was getting heavier now, and the light of day was just starting to break. So, is that what you're here for? I asked. David just kept walking. Sooner or later, you'll have to talk about it, I said. What we saw back there, you can't just dismiss it. I'd like to, he replied. Look, let's just say I've got an affliction, all right? I'd like to get rid of it. That's why I'm out here. If anything, he sounded embarrassed. I suppose I understood why. For what it's worth, your affliction saved our lives back there, I said. He chuckled humorously. <laughs> well, it can't all be bad, but trust me, enough of it is. We're lucky it's so close to the full moon. It's easier to change right now. And what happens during the full moon? He paused. His hands went to the silver dagger around his throat. I... I don't know. When I'm changed, I'm still me. For the most part, anyways. I'm wired. Running off instinct. But I'm hoping that if I get the chance, there'll be enough of me in there to commune with the gods. Maybe... Just maybe they'll lift this curse. If they don't, I've got an alternative. He took the dagger off his neck. That's why I don't want other people around. It's easy to lose control. When I saw you in the woods last night, all I could think about was the blood rushing through your veins. The way it would feel on my tongue. If I slipped, if I wasn't in control, I nodded slowly and David sighed. You know, I read somewhere that silver can kill any supernatural being. I thought that if push came to shove, it could kill me too. I could wear it around my neck, and if someone needed to, they could kill me. He offered me the dagger. I stared at it quietly. You trust me with this? I asked. You weren't running after me to kill me last night, and you've had your shot ever since I changed back, he replied. Besides, as of right now, you and Tanner are the only people who know. I don't think he could do it. I glanced back to see Tanner a short distance behind us, having stopped to relieve himself. I took the dagger and slipped it into my pocket. If it comes to it, I'll do what I have to, I promised. David seemed satisfied with that answer. It wasn't too long after that that we found Candace first I barely recognized her, but when I saw the dark red against the white of the snow and birch trees, I felt a familiar sinking feeling in my gut. David stopped in his tracks beside me. She'd been stripped naked and hollowed out, just like the deer had been. Her arms and legs were splayed, leaving her carcass on display for us to see. Her head rested on her shoulder, eyes wide as if she were still surprised by her killer. David and I stood and stared at her. As Tanner caught up behind us. Holy shit. She went off on her own, I said. I guess her odds weren't so good after all. I reached for my flask and took a long pull on it. Far in the distance, behind Candace, I saw something standing in between the trees. It was not like one of the things I had seen last night. This creature was much taller and I could see its beady eyes shining in the darkness. It was watching me, studying me, seeing how I'd react. Silently, it turned and skulked off into the depths of the forest. I looked over at David, but he didn't seem as if he'd seen it. I didn't want him to worry by mentioning it either. Instead, I kept walking, leaving Candace behind. The woods felt too quiet now but they did not feel empty. I could have sworn I saw movement behind every tree. The virgin snow before us indicated that no one was ahead of us, but I still did not feel safe. As the snow drifted down lazily around us, I felt like I was being watched, hunted, 
but there were no animals out there. Nothing except us and pale birch trees as far as the eye could see. They jutted out of the ground like pale skinny fingers and seemed to be reaching for us. At my side, David kept quiet, but I could see his eyes always moving. They're still following us, he said. The answer to the question I'd never asked. I can smell them. It wasn't long afterwards that we began to hear the drums. They were distant, but nevertheless they were there. A small beacon of civilization amongst the loneliness of the forest. But it felt more ominous than welcoming. They were fast and aggressive. Tell me I'm not the only one hearing that, Tanner murmured. I hear it too. It's distant, David said. Getting further away, but still too close. I stood still and quiet listening as the drums echoed through the trees. Better be having a fucking party, Tanner said. Of a sort, I think, I replied. They sound like war drums. War drums, <laughs> Tanner repeated and he laughed. Oh, great. So that means we've pissed them off, right? Like, they're going to come for us in force tonight, aren't they? More than likely, David said. We're in their territory now. From their point of view, they're within their rights to defend it. And we're within our rights to defend ourselves, Tanner snapped. His expression softened as he did. Both David and I were looking at him. I'm sorry, I didn't. You're scared, I said. That's fine. Fear is a natural response, especially during times like these. I'm scared too, but fear won't help us. We all made a choice to come here. We need to follow through. I did not need to remind him what the alternative was. The image of Candace's body was still fresh in our minds. Tanner didn't reply. The look on his face was one of swallowed pride and he avoided meeting my eyes. When I began to walk again, he kept pace behind me, limping slightly as he did. After about a half hour, I'd fallen in beside the man. I let David lead us on in our directionless pursuit. I'm sorry if I came across harshly, I'm not trying to scare you even more, I said. You don't have to try at this stage, Tanner replied dryly. This was a mistake. This fucking trip was a goddamn mistake. I should have never listened to those stories. Desperation can drive people to do things they regret, I said. That's why I'm here, isn't it? That's why David is here. But you're both prepared for this, he said. And you... You both deserve this more than I do. I'm not a cop. I'm not a fucking werewolf. I'm just a guy with a backpack who couldn't accept that his career was done. I'm just a girl with a crush who can't accept that he's going to die, I replied. You can simplify it all you want. You can beat yourself down. But at the end of the day, you're out here with us. Maybe we can't all receive our boon. But at least the rest of us can walk out of here alive. Maybe you can still do something with your life. Tanner was quiet for a moment as we walked. Maybe, he said softly. Karen? David has stopped ahead of us and I moved past Tanner to rejoin him. What's going on? I asked as I approached. But there was no need for David to answer my question. I saw for myself. The forest was a little less dense ahead of us. The trees were more spread out, but between them I could see structures scattered around. The sight of them seemed so surreal and I remained rooted to the spot for a moment. I couldn't get an accurate count of how many there were. They almost resembled tippus, but they were made entirely of birch wood, stacked neatly and bound together to create large conical tents. Many of them were built around tall birch trees and it was evident that some space had been cleared to make room for this little village. I guess we found their home, David said softly as he advanced deeper into the village. It would seem so, I replied. I spotted a nearby structure made of stone and approached it. I could see smoke drifting out of it and could smell something cooking inside. The light of a fire danced in the darkness of the entrance. Karen? David asked. I looked back to see him and Tanner a few feet behind me. I'm just looking, I assured them. Stay close and keep your ears open. David gave me a reproachful look, but he did not argue as I continued to approach the smokehouse. The inside was plain but spacious, 
The ceiling was incredibly tall and the dirt floor had a fire pit set in the middle of it. A freshly stoked fire roared inside. I could see various pieces of meat spit it over the fire and crouched down to study them. Though the meat was blackened, my eyes widened as I realized what I was looking at. A heart, liver, kidneys, and a uterus. All of them looked to be fresh, and I had seen enough autopsies to recognize human organs when I saw them. I stumbled back a few steps, a hand over my mouth in revulsion. My stomach heaved, trying to reject the light breakfast I had had. I fought to keep it down. On the dirt floor beside me, I spotted a pile of torn clothes and animal skins. I recognized part of Candace's jacket, and it only confirmed a truth I had already known. Taking one last look at her roasting organs, I made my way over to her shredded clothes. I wasn't looking for anything in particular, just anything that could have been of use. When she fled camp last night, she had not thought to bring much with her beyond a few days worth of supplies, nothing more than she could carry discreetly. However, even amongst those supplies, I was a little surprised to find a journal much like my own. I looked over at her roasting organs again before deciding that it didn't much matter if I opened it. I skimmed through her entries. The earliest ones were dated from a few months prior. I have included some experts here. June 11th. What I've read on the old gods say that they are not accustomed to appearing before just anyone. I've heard a few mentions regarding striders. Different sources have called them by different names. Dryads, the children of the deep woods, and various other titles. But the descriptions always seem to match. I guess it makes sense that whatever's out there isn't just the old gods. Someone has to be there to keep out the rabble. Seems to me that that's what the striders do. June 29th. I've been hearing more whispers about the old gods of the forest. It's good to hear that people are getting the word out. I've called in an old gambling debt from one of the park rangers. He's monitoring where people go when they enter the park for me, and he'll let me know if anyone stops by that one clearing. If I'm right, the path to the old gods should be there. The full moon will be coming shortly. Hopefully somebody shows. July 9th. The first group still hasn't come back. I'm thinking that they either got lost or something else found them. I'm placing my bets on the latter. I'm making plans to deliberately send in a second group out next month. I want to be sure. If the Striders are out there guarding the old posts, I need to know what I'd be up against. August 6th. The second group has been doing pretty well, all things considered. I told them about the Striders, although they don't seem to have encountered anything within the past few days. I'm starting to feel a little discouraged. August 8th. I saw the footage today. One of the GoPros captured footage of something moving through the woods. Three of them have gone dark. I assume they're dead. I guess that's a few grand I get to save. My wallet will thank me for that. The last one was able to slip away in the commotion. Doesn't seem like the Striders are all that smart. September 2nd. The Striders became more active around the full moon. I think my prodding has riled them up a little. I'll up the price and pay another group of idiots to poke around and see how things go. If it goes as well as last time, I doubt I'll even have to pay them. But I think that come October, I won't be able to wait any longer. My debts are getting impatient. I've been trying to turn things around at the tables, but I'm running out of money. I can slip past the striders, so long as they're distracted. Then I can get an audience with the old gods. I'm out of options. October 1st. I've set up a camp in the clearing. I'll wait until a decent number of people show up, then we'll all go in together. When the striders come, I'll let them take them. I packed a gun for emergencies, but it's better to keep it hidden. Better to play the fool and let the patsies lead. Hopefully it won't be a long hike. The full moon is close, and if I don't come up with something soon, my debts aren't going to be happy. What I read disgusted me. Of course Candace had known all along. We'd been there as bait for her, so she could petition a god to get rid of her gambling debts of all the stupid things. I stuffed her journal into the back of my jacket, took one final look at Candace's remains as they burned. Any pity I had for her was long gone, and I left the smokehouse quietly. Everything all right? Tanner asked quietly. 
he'd got near to the building. What's in there? What is it? Tanner asked. Meat, I replied. Human meat. David grimaced beside him, before glancing around at the trees. Best to leave it, he said softly. We're clearly not wanted here already. I'd hate to disturb their things. I thought about sharing what I'd learned about Candace with them, although this hardly seemed like the place. We should keep moving, David said. I can still smell them on the wind. They're close by. Tanner paused, looking around as David said that. Then let's go, I said. I brushed past both of them and continued onwards toward the edge of the village. But ahead of me, I saw movement. A tall, lanky figure darted between the trees. David saw it too. They're already here. Suddenly, the booms roared to life around us. They seemed to be coming from the forest itself, and their booming noises seemed to set my skull alight with pain. Run! I remember screaming. And the others did not need to be told twice. I looked back only once, and when I did, I saw countless figures standing in the village, where we had been a mere seconds ago. I could not see them clearly, but I made out hollow eyes and pale legs beneath deer skins and antlers. We disappeared into the trees. I was running faster than I ever had in my life, and yet I could hear the chittering voices behind me as we were hunted. I glanced to my left, but I could not see David nearby. I could hear Tanner beside me, so I knew he was still there. But there was no sign of David. Panic seized me. Had they gotten him? Was he dead? I could not dwell on my thoughts as adrenaline kept my mind focused only on escape and survival. Ahead, I could see nothing but more trees, but the ground beneath me gave out a little. I only stopped myself in time to avoid going down a steep incline. Shit, 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 I heard Tanner murmur. An arrow whistled past us and we both looked back. Amongst the trees, I could see glowing eyes and figures approaching us. They weaved between the birch trees masterfully, keeping us from getting a good look at them. I didn't know how many there were. I drew my pistol, but at that range, and without a clear shot, it wouldn't do me much good. We need to jump, I said, and grabbed Tanner's arm. Come on! No, he pushed me off of him. I'm not going. They're coming! They'd follow us down! I looked at Tanner to argue, but his face was calmer than it should have been. He looked at the advancing creatures with a stern expression. He didn't need to say it. I knew what he was thinking. It was never going to be me anyways, he said softly. Before I could protest, he threw his weight against me. Then I was falling. I looked up at him as I toppled over the incline. Tanner looked more at peace than he'd been since the day we'd set out, and I knew that his choice had been deliberate. I hit the ground and rolled until I reached the bottom of the incline. I was dizzy and shaken, but alive and unharmed, save for a few bruises. I could hear the chittering voices above me, and they were soon intercut by Tanner's horrible screams. My heart seized in my chest, but I didn't linger. He'd made his choice, and he was beyond saving now. I only hoped that it had been quick. On unsteady feet, I started to run again, disappearing into the thick birch trees as the snow drifted down lazily around me. I felt like I was running for hours. I could still see daylight far ahead of me, but the woods were dark. The trees around me were thick and old. I felt as if I had shrank and my lungs burned with exhaustion. Slowly, my energy tapered out and I slowed to a walk. The striders were nowhere near me, but neither was David. I didn't know where he was anymore. The air around me seemed so much colder. My coat barely shielded me from the chill in the air and I wrapped my arms around myself in a desperate attempt to try and hold in my warmth. I stepped over broken trees as the canopy above me grew thicker than it had before. The white birch trees around me made me uneasy. With every step, I anticipated movement between them. Perhaps movement would have been a mercy, but instead the world around me was dead silent. There was nothing to be seen out there. Not at first, anyways. Then, as I continued my slow, uncertain trek, I stopped as I spotted something between the trees. Another corpse, strung up just like Candace had been. But this one was far older. It was mostly bone. The flesh had rotted away long ago. As I stared at it, I spotted a second corpse further behind it. And a third. 
I looked around me, and in the shadows I could see countless strung-up corpses amongst the broken trees. Most of them were old, but some of them were more recent. Looking at the carcass of a young man, I realized that this must have been one of the people Candace sent out to verify if the old gods were real. His half-lidded eyes stared emptily up at the sky above, like Jesus on his cross. This place felt like a trophy case, a sick memoir to victims claimed. I wondered if this had been the work of the Striders, but something seemed off. The village I'd just seen had been organized. There were signs of some sort of culture. While its denizens were brutal, they had not just been savage creatures. They had been intelligent. There was intelligence in the way those bodies were strung up, and yet there was more to it than that. This felt like something else entirely. Looking up at the trees around me, a pit formed in my stomach as I saw the state of the branches around me. Many of them were broken, as if something massive regularly passed between the trees. Entire trees looked to have been splintered as if attacked in a vicious rage, and as I looked at the area around me, it occurred to me that this place seemed less like a graveyard and more like a battleground. Suddenly, I understood. These were the ones who had failed. This was their punishment. They had come into the forest for one reason or another, seeking a boon from the old gods of the forest, and they had been unable to defeat their final greatest trial. In the distance, I heard heavy footsteps, and I rushed towards the nearest tree, hoping desperately that it could hide me. I could see it clearly as it moved through the forest. The trees kept its shape obscured, but I could still see it, and I could recognize it, although only barely. This was the same thing I had seen earlier in the day, hiding in the trees when we discovered Candace's body. The creature stalked through the woods, and a part of me feared that it was coming to add another trophy to its collection. Had it encountered David? Had it killed him? No, the creature didn't seem interested in stopping. It moved onwards towards another errand and disappeared into the darkness just as quickly as it had appeared. Its footsteps faded away slowly until finally there was nothing but wind and silence. When I was sure I was alone, I turned and continued to walk in the other direction the creature had gone in. I wasn't ready to meet it. Not yet. I wasn't looking for the clearing, but when I saw the light through the trees... I had to investigate. Like everything else, it was dead silent. A small pond near the middle and the trees surrounding it were mostly bare save for a few autumn leaves that stubbornly held on despite the unseasonal weather. The sky was getting dark. Twilight was setting in. Karen? I paused when I saw a figure moving through the woods. David! I ran to him and stopped just short of throwing my arms around him in a hug. He had no such reservations. Your life, he said softly. I thought I was the only one left. I fell while we were running. I, I lost track of you and... He paused, pulling back a little. Tanner. Gone, I replied. The Striders got him. The Striders? I took Candace's journal from my pocket. I found this in the village, along with some more pieces of her old friend... I only skimmed it, but it's enough to know that Candace already knew what we were walking into. David's brow furrowed before he shook his head. God damn it. I knew she was playing us. And look how well it worked out for her, I replied. For the first time, I allowed myself to look around the clearing. David huffed in agreement. <laughs> well, regardless, I'm glad you made it out alive at least. I was going to make camp here. I was a little afraid of doing it alone, though. Something about the air here. It feels different. In a good or bad way, I asked. I'm not sure. Good, maybe. I don't sense any danger if that's what you're asking. I looked around the clearing. It seemed peaceful enough, and it would be dark soon. Let's try and start a fire, then, I suggested. Then, I suppose we wait. I helped David gather up whatever wood we could find. Getting a fire started was harder than it normally was. The wood was too wet, and when we couldn't get anything going, I emptied the last of my flask into the pile of kindling that we had and struck a match. It wasn't the ideal situation, but at least it allowed us to start a fire. When the alcohol had burned away, 
the wood it caught. The sun was quickly fading and David looked out towards the birch trees as we warmed ourselves by the fire. Are they still out there? Yes, he said. I can hear them moving through the trees. More than were there last night. We're in their territory now and they're watching us. This is a place where man is not meant to be. They want us gone. I slowly nodded before sitting down in the snow beside him. As long as we've still got each other, I think we should be fine, I said. David huffed in agreement. <laughs> Maybe. What do we do if the gods won't take us both? Well, figure something out, I replied. But there's always an answer. I am writing this now, as I do not know what will happen next. This may very well be my final entry, but that is fine. I've come so far, and I would do it again. I know now that the old gods of the forest are real, and I can only hope that they will grant me my wish. Please. Please.